Stars are beautiful, colorful things. There are red giants. Those are nearing the end of their lives and are on the verge of explosions. Blue stars shine in the belt of the constellation Orion, as well as other places. Yellow ones, like our sun, are pretty ordinary. They're usually warm and stable enough to support life. But look at the night sky attentively. Do you see any green or purple stars? Nope. They're kinda invisible because of the way we humans perceive visible light. The color of a star mostly depends on its surface temperature. The hotter it is, the shorter wavelengths the light it emits will have. The hottest stars are blue or white. Blue. Those are some of the shortest wavelengths of light. Cooler stars are normally red and red-brown, which are longer wavelengths. At the same time, stars never send out their light in just one wavelength. It's more of a range of light. The wavelengths of light from a star peak, in just one color, in a bell-shaped curve. But, the star emits other colors too. Human eyes have evolved to see yellow and green radiation. Probably because our sun emits it mainly in these wavelengths. But a green star emits radiation right in the center of the visible light spectrum. In all possible colors. That's why such stars appear white. Which is a combination of all hues. Actually, our sun emits quite a lot of green light but we perceive it as white. Purple stars though are something our eyes won't ever see because they're sensitive to blue light. And since stars emitting purple light send out a lot of blue light too, because these shades are next to each other on the visible light spectrum. The human eye picks up only the blue light. When it comes to other objects in the solar system, many planets seem to have no obvious hue. Look at Venus, Saturn, or Jupiter. They look kinda bland, probably whitish at best. But there are several planets that boast very decisive colors. For example, Mars looks orange-red, Neptune is blue and Uranus has a beautiful blue-green hue. The planet gets it from all that methane gas in its atmosphere. Meteors sometimes display a vivid green too, and look at breathtaking bright auroras. Green is the most common color of the northern lights. But not stars, never stars. The brightest star in the sky, besides our sun of course, is Sirius. It's twice as bright as its competitor, Canopus, located in the southern constellation, Carina. Being the most brilliant, Sirius is very easy to identify. Probably the coolest thing about this star is that it seems to be changing its color. But we'll get to it a bit later. This star is wider and hotter than the sun. Its surface temperature is 17,300 degrees F, while the sun's surface temperature only reaches 10,000 degrees F. When you combine the immense heat Sirius emits with its girth, 1.75 times the size of the sun, You'll understand why the star looks so bright in the night sky. Sirius has a companion star. It's called the Pup. It's a tiny but incredibly dense white dwarf with a diameter of a mere 7,000 miles. This makes it smaller than Earth. At the same time, its mass reaches 98% of that of the Sun. It means that the matter inside this tiny star is squeezed very very tightly. That's why its gravitational pull is 350,000 times greater than Earth's, a person weighing 150 pounds would weigh 50 million pounds on this star. Now, Sirius is famous for its twinkling. And since it is also the brightest star, we can observe the ever-present turbulence in its atmosphere quite well. As for the star changing its color, it has to do with the atmosphere of our planet. Pockets of air at different temperatures. Focus starlight this way and that like small lenses. We see it as twinkling. But since white light is made of different colors, one pocket might send some red our way. Another will send blue or yellow in totally random order. That's why it seems that Sirius twinkles in color. Now, did you know that our sun is actually green? Okay, okay, I'm kidding. But in reality, it's all colors you can imagine at the same time. Wait, what? I know it sounds like a joke, but I'm being serious, can't you tell? In fact, our sun contains absolutely all the waves of the light spectrum. It's simultaneously red, blue, green, yellow, you name it. Where do you think rainbows come from? When sunlight gets reflected off water droplets in the air, it splits into a bunch of colored waves that we can see individually. And when they're all together, we see a white ray of light. Our eyes are unable to perceive the concept of all colors at the same time. 
so their combination seems white to us. Wait, you might say, why white? Isn't the sun yellow? Yep, it's yellow too, but please don't stare at the sun just to make sure. It appears white when we see it from the International Space Station. This is the sun's real color as our eyes perceive it. The sun gets a yellowish hue when its rays get scattered in Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere doesn't let the blue rays of the spectrum pass very well, but the red ones? Hey, sure, why not? By the way, that's why the sky seems blue to us. The atmosphere scatters the blue color all over the place. During sunrise and sunset, short blue waves get reflected, but the long red ones reach us perfectly. That's why we see sunsets as pink, orange, or red. But what would happen if the sun had a different color? To answer this question, let's quickly repeat what we've learned. 1. The sun has the whole color spectrum in it. 2. Our atmosphere is like blue rays? No. Red rays? Anytime. So you probably already guessed what would happen if the sun was, let's say, red. The whole world would look like it does during sunsets. Not bad, huh? We wouldn't even have to wait for the evening to admire the scarlet sky. Orange water and a bright red moon. Yeah, it would be darker than what we're used to, but still not bad. Oh, by the way, one day, the sun will actually turn red. When its life comes to an end, it will expand and gradually turn into a red giant before finally burning out. But uh, it's not going to be so much fun for us. So let's hope we won't be around to see that moment. I know I won't. Hey, I've got a party to go to. Okay, now, what if the sun was green? Well, the truth is, the sun is green. So here's your dialogue. Wait, are you kidding me? Didn't you just say that it's white? Ooh, good job on that, by the way. Well, not exactly, bud. The sun just looks white, but technically, it has a temperature of around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pink wavelength of the sun's spectrum corresponds to the green-blue hue. But to make sure that the sun is green, we need to drown out the rest of the visible spectrum. Then our atmosphere will let through a pure green color. And what'll happen then? Well, everything will be green. And everything will also be a bit darker. Well, face it, it's not easy being green. Okay, moving on. Now let's paint the sun blue. Blue stars actually do exist. They're called blue giants. Fortunately, our sun is not one of them. Why fortunately? Well, because if it was a blue giant, it would be a young, beautiful, unimaginably large, and very, very hot star. See, our red is hot, blue is cold logic doesn't apply to stars. The hottest stars are white and blue, and the coldest are yellow and red. Yeah, our sun is actually very cold compared to other stars. Now, take the average temperature in your city, but multiply it like by hundreds of thousands. Yeah, we're struggling with global warming here, but global burning? Eh, no thanks, blue giants. Anyway, let's imagine that the sun turned blue. How would we see the world? Surprisingly, nothing would change. Remember how I said that the atmosphere scatters blue light? That's why, in this case, everything would remain almost the same. Maybe the sky would get bluer, but we wouldn't see much difference. And finally, the darkest, pun intended, option. What if our sun turned black? Stock up on lamps and candles because there is no more light. People use electricity all over the world 24-7. We also can't see the moon anymore. After all, we can observe it these days only because the sun's rays get reflected off of it. Now, the only thing we still have to illuminate our nights are stars, but they don't help us much. Good thing this scenario is totally unrealistic and there are no black stars, right? Well, yeah, there are no black stars. And still, our sun will eventually become completely black one day. And I don't mean a black hole. I'm talking about black dwarfs here. You've probably heard of white dwarfs. Maybe even seven dwarfs. When a star like our sun is about to finish its life, it expands and turns into a red giant. And then, gradually losing its upper layers, it turns into white dwarfs. Since they no longer produce fuel, they slowly cool down. All that remains is a small core, living out its life and burning bright. And when the star cools down completely, right, it turns into a black dwarf. But you've probably never heard of them. Why? Because, surprise, surprise, they don't exist. And no, I was not lying. The thing is, a star needs about one quadrillion years to turn into a black dwarf. And our universe is still a baby. It's only about 14 billion years old. 
So no star has reached this stage yet. Even the most ancient of them still emit a little light. That's why black stars are just a theory. And it's unlikely that we'll ever see such a star at all. But remember the famous saying, the stars that we see at night are already ghosts because their light has reached us only now. Well, that's a myth. They're all still alive. Why am I telling you all this? Well, let's imagine that our sun turned into a black dwarf. The entire solar system would immediately get plunged into absolute darkness. It would also be terribly cold. The moon would leave its orbit and crash into Earth. Wait, no. Let's overlook this moment and assume we're still alive. Fortunately, we wouldn't freeze instantly, as you might think. Earth's core has its own temperature, more than 9,000 degrees. But the temperatures on the surface of the planet would still immediately drop to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The core would gradually cool down. Every two months, its temperature would drop by two times. In just two months, Earth's surface temperature would be minus 190 degrees, and in a year, it would reach minus 450 degrees. Most plants would disappear pretty quickly, not because of the cold, but because of the lack of photosynthesis. Others would live a little longer thanks to the oxygen still remaining in the atmosphere. And, oddly enough, trees would survive for a very long time. They have a slow metabolism and get sugar from the ground. The upper layer of the oceans would freeze very quickly. Fortunately, this thick crust of ice would insulate deep waters, so the entire ocean wouldn't freeze for some time. Marine creatures would be doing pretty well. They existed long before us and are already used to crazy temperature changes, the lack of oxygen and food, huge pressures, and other joys of deep-sea life. And what about us humans? Well, first of all, we'd start getting sick. Without vitamin D, people would face a huge number of different health problems. Also, our bodies need sunlight to produce melatonin. This melatonin helps us understand when we should go to bed and wake up. If people didn't have this hormone, their bodies would get very confused and wouldn't understand whether they needed to sleep or not. That would mean insomnia for many people. But we would still be able to survive. We'd have two options to build giant submarines and go down into the depths of the ocean closer to Earth's core, or stay on the surface, living our lives in some location where we'd have sources of geothermal energy. In Iceland, for example. We could also settle near volcanoes. Their heat would be enough to warm us for a long time. Our vision would adapt to the dark, but at some point, it would reach its maximum. So we'd need to get used to living in complete darkness. But who knows? Maybe we would adapt to this life, too. So, which option would you prefer? Living at the bottom of the ocean in a submarine or on the surface near volcanoes? If the sun decided to stop producing light, then the animals in the wild would be the first to notice. Most animals need daytime to roam from place to place, especially in the large savannas in Africa. Zebras, wildebeests, and giraffes all need the day to move to avoid predators. As soon as the sun goes down, it's their bedtime. If the sun suddenly went dark, animals wouldn't comprehend what was going on and would simply become an early lunch for predators. Nocturnal creatures would be equally confused at the time change. Birds usually flock during the day, so we wouldn't hear or see any of them. We have them to thank for eating pests in the sky. Well, them and bats. But if you're in an area with no bats, then consider the insects to be the winners here. Temperatures would start to drop gradually. Humans would notice the effects as well. We're used to having the sun shining at the peak of noon, but with the sunshine's disappearance, we would be living in total darkness. It'd just be a matter of survival. If the sun suddenly got dark, then we'd only have around eight minutes to enjoy the rest of it. That's because it takes that much time for sunlight to travel thousands of miles across the solar system. We would have to use UV lights to grow some crops, but it wouldn't be enough to feed the whole world, not to mention the dropping temperatures across the world. Survival would be difficult in the open plain. Everyone would have to duck inside shelters and warm bunkers. Plants need photosynthesis to grow. Without it, we wouldn't have any crops. Bread wouldn't exist, since it needs wheat. Even the algae in the oceans need photosynthesis to survive, which is the highest source of oxygen rather than forests. This means oxygen levels would start to deplete. 
large bodies of water like lakes, oceans, and seas would also start to lack oxygen to sustain marine life. One of our main sources of vitamin D is the sun. There are other ways of getting it, but the sun is the best and most convenient way. Without crops or vegetation, all the herbivores would have to rummage for the last green grass on land or a leaf hanging from a tree. They would soon run out of food, which would also be bad news for us humans, since we need animals like cows, horses, and sheep for our livelihoods. This wouldn't happen overnight. Of course, the oceans would remain warm for some time, but eventually, they would get cold and freeze. Earth is still a planet powered by an iron core that produces so much heat. This would not be enough to keep the planet warm. Our next step would be finding the right shelter and keeping warm. If this happened overnight, then chances are there wouldn't be any ready-made bunkers for a scenario like this. Unless you're watching this video and decide to build one after. They would have to provide heat 24-7 and be capable of growing crops under UV light. Solar-powered facilities would be a thing of the past. People would have to wear sustainable suits when venturing out into the open. Since it would be so dark, we would need strong lights or powerful night vision goggles to see anything. The lands would be desolate. Nocturnal creatures that can handle freezing temperatures would take it over. Structures would collapse since there would be oxygen depletion. Concrete needs oxygen to remain intact. The bunkers themselves would have limited oxygen as well. We would need to uproot many trees and place them under strong UV lights for them to produce oxygen. In turn, it would produce its ecosystem in the large underground bunkers. The oceans on the surface would freeze over eventually. Gathering any natural resources from the ocean floor, like gas or oil, would be impossible. The large object, which used to be a bright and sunny star, would still be floating around. But what would happen if the sun disappeared overnight? Well, pretty much the same thing, except way worse. The sun is the largest celestial object in our solar system, which keeps all of our planets lined up the way they are. They orbit around the sun, minding their own business. Without such a large object keeping them steady, the planets would start to float around randomly. Some might even collide with each other. In other cases, the planets would just float around and fly off into space eventually, until they found a new star to orbit around. Earth might or might not be one of those planets. Our planet would still be dark. We would be flying through space at an unusual speed. The planet wouldn't rotate on itself, and many objects would crash into us. We'd be in the trajectory line of mass comets waiting to strike us down. The threat of the cold wouldn't be a major factor anymore. It would be what's beyond us. This means we'd have to dig our bunkers deeper. We wouldn't have an atmosphere anymore to trap any form of heat or anything. We would be floating for an eternity. But let's go back to that scenario where the sun just decided to go dark. Don't worry, our planet would still be orbiting the sun along with the other planets. The temperatures would keep plummeting until nothing could survive on the surface. It would be total darkness 24-7. Only bacteria and possibly tardigrades could survive on the surface. Tardigrades are microscopic critters that can survive just about anything, including outer space. Eventually, oxygen would be absent from the Earth's surface and there wouldn't be anything up there anymore except for them. Since they would be the dominant and possibly the only creatures on the surface, they'd manage to evolve into bigger species and produce many more. Hundreds of thousands of years into the future, humans would have had to evolve to the conditions underground. Our eyes would be much bigger to take up as much light as possible. Our skin would become whiter since there would be no sun underground. Our hearing would also be much more sensitive since the underground would create echoing sounds. We'd still have the intellect we do now, but our bodies would be ready for the surface. The main threat would be the giant tardigrades sluggishly dragging themselves around. Under a microscope, they look kind of cute, but imagine them the size of a polar bear. Still want something like this in your backyard? They can live anywhere, so they'd infiltrate the bunkers now and then. They'd get ferocious and come in different sizes and shapes. At this point, humans would not be the dominant species since they'd have to hide underground. 
Some tardigrades from different tribes wouldn't be friendly with each other. Major cities that used to be bustling with people would be home to giant water bears. Tardigrades are known as water bears since they kind of look like little bears. But these beasts with eight legs would be much bigger than them. Bears and most animals would have been wiped out on the surface. Under the ice, some deep sea creatures would thrive and have moved closer to the surface. These animals were used to living in darkness away from the sun. But over thousands of years of dominating the waters, they'd have grown to enormous sizes. Some of these creatures would adapt to crawling out of the mainland. Even though the surface would be frozen, they'd still find ways to crack through the ice and make their way. Humans, meanwhile, would create large underground channels and networks, building cities and colonies. We'd dominate the tunnels where our hands and feet would grow to become web-like and large. We'd take over everything underground and remain the smartest species on Earth. We'd manage to keep old art pieces from the surface and important records to stay as human as possible. We'd keep on surviving no matter what. More than one million Earths can fit in our sun. New research shows that between 20% to 35% of suns eat their own planets, and a quarter of planetary systems orbiting stars like the sun had a chaotic past. The very thing that gives life can also take it away. All the planets in our solar system revolve around the sun, and they all do it in a somewhat consistent way. It's most likely that they stayed that way ever since they first came into the picture, but not all of them. This chaotic existence means that a solar system had a lot of planets in the litter until the host sun decided to melt them away. Our solar system is panned out perfectly so that no planet's gravity interferes with each other. The gravitational force on Jupiter is a lot tougher than Earth's, which means that if Earth gets close to Jupiter, we'd be another moon for Jupiter. The planet is so big that if Earth were the size of a grape, Jupiter would be the size of a basketball compared to it. Even with the best technology in the world, it's difficult to tell if stars do, in fact, eat their planets. The best way to study this is to observe binary systems. That's just a sciencey way of saying a system with two stars orbiting each other. Usually, the two stars were formed around the same time, from the same gases, and the same conditions. It means they should contain the same elements, more or less. When you open your eyes in the morning, the sunlight that's been traveling for millions of miles greets you. The closer we get to it, the hotter it is. But the rays traveling from the sun also contain certain chemicals that make it unique. The chemicals that are associated with the sun are light materials like oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and helium. You can find some other stuff in it too, but these are the main ones. By studying these elements, you can learn the history of a solar system with enough detail to determine if it was chaotic or smooth. Scientists studied 107 binary systems composed of suns like ours by analyzing the light. Since each system contains two suns, they compared and contrasted them to see the differences. They observed the stars with a thin outer layer, having different elements than their companion. All suns contain light elements, but there are some that have rocky elements, like iron, silicon, and titanium near the sun. These elements are associated with rough terrains that you'd find on the surface, but they're out there floating in the middle of space. The thinnest outer layer is especially rich in iron compared to the other layers. Many stars are twins at birth. Even most of the Milky Way stars have a buddy in a binary system. It means our sun is pretty unique for not having a partner. But there are some theories out there that suggest that the sun may have lost its twin in the past. It's around 184 light years away and is called HD 186302. And this might be our lucky star. A stellar nursery is where thousands of stars are born. They're made up of gas and dust that gradually collapse under their own weight. Our sun may have started in such a way 4.6 billion years ago. And when they're mature enough, they go out into the open, usually with their travel buddy. Actually, scientists claim that up to 85% of all stars could be in binary pairs or have more buddies, but over 50% are dual pairs. The only problem is that we can't really see it since it strayed from its original orbit an eternity ago. 
but traces of it can be found in the Oort cloud. That's the vast cluster of space consisting of comets, space rocks, and ice in the outer edges of our sun's reach. They float around quite a lot, since they're far off the sun's gravity and can easily be knocked out of their orbit into open space. Flying through such a space is no different than flying through any random void of space. The reason why some of these light elements in space contain rock elements you'd find on the surface of a planet is because the sun knocked them off their orbit and devoured them as they got closer. It also happens when a star becomes too big in its place and starts eating everything around it. According to scientists, if a star eats a planet, it can make it go chaotic and spin so quickly that it eventually rips apart. But don't worry, there's a very low chance of the sun devouring the planet in the near future. Stars are formed when a huge cloud of hydrogen and helium grows until it collapses under its own weight. The pressure increases and reaches extreme heat levels we can't even measure. Eventually, the hydrogen atoms lose their electrons, causing the hydrogen to fuse together and release energy, countering the gravity collapsing. But when the gravitational force overpowers the hydrogen fusion, the star begins to expand and becomes a red giant. And then, after around a billion years, the hydrogen in the outer core will go away, leaving plenty of helium hanging around, which will fuse with the rest of the elements around. And once all the helium disappears, gravity will shrink the red giant into a white dwarf. And when it's completely gone, the remains of the star release tons of gas and dust into space. Scientists claim that our sun has between 7 to 8 billion years left before it reaches that stage. But even if that becomes a reality, it wouldn't happen overnight. Something like this takes millions of years to take place. But what if the sun decided to devour us overnight as we speak? The planet would start feeling hot in seconds. Every slight degree change can lead to some catastrophic events. Ice caps can melt in a matter of seconds and flood the coastal lands. Even little islands in remote areas of the world will be submerged. And as it gets hotter, every snow-capped area will melt instantly and turn into desert-like climates. Some places will burn and your everyday objects will melt on the spot. The Earth's interior will also get hotter, allowing volcanic eruptions to happen across the world. Antarctica will melt from the heat, as well as the volcanoes erupting inside. And just in a matter of minutes, the whole planet will turn into fire and ash before it explodes into tiny bits floating in space, reaching areas we've never even heard of. But no worries, something like this won't really happen. In case the sun knocks us off our rotation, the results would be different. It'll also get hot because the magnetic field around us protects us from the sun's radiation. And once we get knocked out of place, the magnetic field gets tarnished and the extreme heat from the sun will boil us. The gravitational force will be unstable, so the physics of our everyday life will be chaotic. We'll have to wait five billion years from now when the sun turns into a red giant. It'll grow in size, eventually eating up Mercury and Venus. Chances are, Earth will also be on the menu. If Earth were to move only 900,000 miles closer to the sun, then it would be uninhabitable. It may seem like a lot, but it's only four times the distance between the moon and Earth. Detecting the chemical composition of the sun rays in solar systems that are further away could help scientists find other Earth-like planets. Since the atmosphere around these planet-eating stars changes the chemical composition, we can detect which solar systems out there have had a calm past. The main thing we have to observe is if the planets have a healthy orbit cycle. With nothing else getting in the way, we can assume that the planet could follow the same steps as Earth did for humans to be here. But this process will take ages, since there are millions of nearby stars similar to our Sun. The odds of finding a planet similar to ours are near impossible at this rate. But if so, then there might be life on those planets. There will be no way of knowing if it's intelligent life, but they might have had the same evolutionary fate as us. Betelgeuse, a red supergiant. This ball of boiling plasma is one of the largest stars in our galaxy and one of the brightest. It's about 500 times larger than the sun. But Betelgeuse is pulsating, getting bigger and smaller. At its peak, it becomes 800 times its average size. If this star were a bucket, 
it would fit about 300 million suns, even though its weight is only 17 times greater. And here, about 500 light years away, is Earth. We launch our faster than light spaceship and set off on our journey to Betelgeuse. A few seconds, and we've already traveled 240,000 miles and now are close to the moon. That's nine and a half trips around the Earth. A traditional rocket powered spacecraft would take three days to get here. We're near Mars now. The flight to the Red Planet usually takes about seven months. Several rovers are now at work here, as well as the first ever flying drone, Ingenuity. The surface of Mars is three times smaller than that of Earth. The planet is also 10 times lighter. People hope to build a human colony here soon. Right beyond Mars, we have to wiggle and constantly dodge space rocks. This is the asteroid belt. It contains debris and space objects of different sizes and shapes. The biggest of them is Ceres. Its surface is slightly larger than the area of Argentina, and its weight is about 1% of the moon's. The total weight of the entire asteroid belt is 25 times less than the moon's. Next, we pass gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. These are the largest planets in the solar system. They're also the heaviest, even though they don't have a solid surface. Then, we travel by Uranus and Neptune. They're called ice giants. And at the very edge of the solar system, we see Pluto. It was once considered a full-fledged planet, but now it's not even on the list. After that, we're 4.3 billion miles away from our home. It took the New Horizons space probe about nine years to get here. Hold on to your seat, we are speeding up. We're passing through the Kuiper Belt. There are lots of asteroids and blocks of ice here. These are some of the oldest building materials in our solar system. Billions of years ago, our whole world looked like a cloud of these asteroids. We're traveling further through dark space and reach the edge of the solar system, the heliosphere. All this time, we've been moving with the solar wind, but now it starts to slow down, collides with the interstellar wind, and heats up. This is called the termination shock. The Voyager 1 space probe got to this point in December 2004. We're moving to the region where the heliosphere ends and interstellar space begins. This is the heliopause. In 2012, Voyager crossed this boundary and became the first ever human-made object in interstellar space. But the message from Voyager reporting this event came to Earth almost a year later because of the huge distance. It took 35 years for Voyager 1 to travel all this way. And here it is. The probe is as long as a car and weighs like two motorcycles. You can see a gold plate on its hull. It's a message from people to potential civilizations out there. It has pictures of Earth's landscapes, recordings of human speech, and our DNA. As of 2021, Voyager has been operational for almost 43 years. The probe has traveled 14 billion miles. That's like 152 Earth to the Sun distances. And it's still making its way through space at 38,000 miles per hour. Now, we're approaching the nearest star to our solar system. It's Proxima Centauri. We're so far from home that even light needs more than four years to travel this distance. If we used a traditional rocket, the trip would take us 73,000 years. The reason we wanted to get here was because of an Earth-like planet called Proxima Centauri b. It's 10% larger than Earth and slightly heavier. It lies in the habitable zone of its host star. It means that water might exist on the planet in its liquid state, and there can be life that forms here. But the star itself occasionally produces flares. Recently, its brightness increased almost 1,000 times. During that time, it emitted so much radiation that even if there were some forms of life on the planet, they probably ceased to exist. We're now more than eight light years away from Earth. The brightest star in our night sky is Sirius. Seriously. It's so bright that you can see it even during the day. But in reality, there are actually two stars, Sirius A and B. They orbit around a common center of gravity, and these stars are moving toward our solar system at almost five miles per second. That's the same as the maximum speed of a top-of-the-line supercar on Earth. Foot down, and we've arrived at a potentially habitable planet 39 light years away from Earth. This is TRAPPIST-1D. Its host star is a white dwarf. It's a cold star, 10 times smaller and lighter than the Sun. There are seven planets around it,
but TRAPPIST-1D is the most similar to Earth. It's only 30% smaller and three times lighter, but it has a rocky surface and the temperature here is 48 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd feel comfortable here wearing a light jacket. There might be an atmosphere, mountains, seas, and oceans here, which means this planet might be suitable for a human colony. But it would take about 677,000 years to get here using traditional rockets. And here's our main goal, Betelgeuse. It'd take nearly 8.7 million years to travel here from Earth in a current day spacecraft. This star is so big that our ship looks like a grain of sand on a giant beach. We have to jump back in time to find out what happened to this star. First, there was a beautiful nebula. It's a cloud of multicolored space dust and debris. Then, it began to shrink under its own weight. In the core of the nebula, a nuclear reaction began. Boom! And the star was born. At first, Betelgeuse was very massive and hot, but it didn't expand and remained stable. Let's look into its heart. The nuclear reactions in the star's core create a lot of heat and energy. This energy produces the force that pushes on the walls of the star from the inside and causes it to expand. But at the same time, the star is very heavy. That's why gravity pushes on it from the outside. If these two forces are balanced, the star remains stable. But over time, the star runs out of its fuel, helium and hydrogen. That's when heavier elements in the core join the nuclear reaction. When they burn, they release more energy and heat than gravity can hold. And the star starts expanding. That's what's happening to Betelgeuse right now. It's already so big that if you put it in the center of our solar system, its edge would touch the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Betelgeuse will continue to expand until it exhausts its fuel completely. Then the gravity will win. The star will shrink in size, and then an enormous boom will happen. A supernova explosion will be so blinding that Betelgeuse will shine brighter than the moon in the night sky. Luckily, Earth is too far away for this explosion to cause any harm to people. A strong stream of matter that will be ejected from the explosion site won't reach the solar system until 6 million years later. Even so, the solar wind will stop this flow, so we'll be safe. Betelgeuse is likely to explode at any time in the next 10,000 years. But some scientists say it won't happen in the next 100 millennia. Back to the moment before the explosion of Betelgeuse, there can be another, more interesting scenario. Gravity might compress the massive core of the star with such force that a black hole will appear in its place. Black holes are the heaviest objects in the universe. They have incredible gravitational force. Even light can't escape their gravitational trap. The Betelgeuse black hole will begin feeding on cosmic dust and whatever is left of the star. All this debris and light from other stars will get frozen near the event horizon of the growing black hole. For the first time in history, we'll be able to watch the birth of this mysterious object. But in reality, Betelgeuse is too light to become a black hole. Most likely, after the explosion, it'll turn into a white dwarf that will gradually fade until it becomes invisible. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carini estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carinae releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carinae is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carinae is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. 
Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carinae experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carinae was the second brightest visible star after Sirius the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare-ups, Eta Carinae has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carinae, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carinae is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carinae is really two stars. Eta Carinae A and Eta Carinae, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carinae C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carinae is, without a doubt, one of the strangest-looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light-years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carinae in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carinae's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carinae because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant place where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table. And when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close. Or, more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before. Many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? 
Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light-years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table, which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in the star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000 plus light years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernova, and now it finally occurred in real life. Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door. We've sent more spacecraft to study the local environment on Mars than on any other planet. We have no evidence that life exists on the Red Planet, or ever did. But that didn't stop some people from wondering. Mostly because of the pictures that NASA's Perseverance and Curiosity rovers take regularly of Mars' surface. Feel free to check them out for yourself on the internet, they're free for anyone to see. Over time, some odd shapes have appeared here and there in these pictures, making some people believe there is some sort of creatures living there already. Back in 2008, one of the rovers took a picture of a rock that looked very much like a female figure. 
other photos seem to show animal-shaped figures, utensils, or other Earth-like objects. Again, there is little to no proof of this theory, as rocks can be of all sorts of shapes and sizes. But if you look at the pictures, it does make you wonder. A lot of people in the scientific community do see Mars as a better place for long-term settlements, even though our moon is closer. Firstly, because it believed there is indeed water on Mars. It's just stuck in underground frozen lakes. The soil doesn't seem to be rich in nutrients, and it may have some harmful chemicals. Moreover, on the red planet, the gravitational pull is only 38% of Earth's, so it's easy to carry heavy objects here. On our moon, for comparison, the gravitational force is only about 16 and 16 percent of that found on Earth. We already have people studying how we might live on Mars right here on our planet. It's because certain regions of Earth closely mimic the harsher conditions on Mars. Daven Island, for example, is the biggest uninhabited island on our planet, located in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. It's easy to see why it's hard to live here. The soil stays frozen all year. The eastern part of the island is covered by a thick ice cap all year round. Summers here only last for less than 50 days and aren't really that warm. Not a lot of plants can grow here, so no animals can adapt to thrive and multiply. As such, the Hutton Mars project started here in 1997 to offer astronauts unique studying opportunities. There are few options here in terms of logistics and transportation, and communicating with people living outside the island is also a bit more difficult. All because of the temperature and barren soil. Think about it, if we can find solution to live here, we might be able to do it on Mars too. Regardless of our local training, the conditions on Mars are currently inhospitable. That's because it's really cold. On average, the temperature is about minus 81 Fahrenheit. Even during the summertime, it's never hotter than 86 Fahrenheit. And to top it all off, the planet's atmosphere is made of 95 and 3 tenth percent carbon dioxide, so there's literally no way we could breathe there without special devices. Mars also lacks a magnetic field on its surface, so it is attacked by the sun's radiation. Because of the temperature variations, Mars often experiences powerful dust storms, which can surround the entire planet. Technically, these storms can physically harm us, but the dust might clog electronics and render solar-powered instruments unstable. We know now that life as we know it is impossible on Mars, but did it ever exist there? This is a question long debated by scientists, since NASA's investigations have determined that some parts of Mars were habitable at one point. We don't know for how long or how far back, and just because something could have lived there, it doesn't mean it actually did. Other recent photos from Mars showed a cloudy sunset. Does that mean it also rains on the red planet? Well, not really. For starters, on our planet clouds are water vapors, and once it starts to rain, the water reaches the surface of our planet in liquid form. This process isn't the same on Mars. Surprisingly, there is more water in Mars clouds, but they are made of iced water. Think of them as a tiny icy fog. Combined with the thin atmosphere and cold temperatures, it keeps the clouds from ever falling to the surface. Sunsets are different here too. According to NASA specialists, there is some fine dust that makes the blue near the sun's part of the sky much more visible on Mars, so the sunsets here have more of a bluish tint. Similar to Earth, Mars is also tilted on its axis, which means it also has seasons. Because the southern hemisphere is directed away from the sun when Mars is farthest from it, the winters here are far colder and summers way hotter. Calendars work differently on Mars too. A year here lasts for about 1 and 88 hundredth Earth years. A day is a bit more longer than 24 hours. Even if we were to ever move to Mars, we'd still have to communicate with our Earth. It would be a bit difficult to do, since a message sent back home would take about 15 minutes to reach its destination. It's not that bad given the entire distance, but it would make video calls kind of annoying. As difficult as it might be for now to live there, there is a lot of stuff to see. 
Some scientists believe that if we were completely colonize Mars, a list of locations would soon be declared national parks, like the area surrounding Olympus Mons, which is the biggest known volcano in the solar system, stretching over 16 miles. Valles Marineris would be another cool location, is being a huge complex of valleys about the distance from Los Angeles to New York. Mars also has some cool polar ice caps, which sometimes experience dry ice snowfall. Saturn and Uranus are unique planets in our solar system because of their rings. It may not have one now, but Mars may be getting a ring of its own in the future. Don't get too excited, it's estimated it may take 10 of millions of years. Mars' largest moon, named Phobos, will be torn apart at one point. The debris resulting from it will settle in a rocky ring around Mars, resembling that of Saturn and Uranus. Speaking of moons, Mars has two of them, that we know of. Apart from Phobos, there is also one more object called Deimos. Both were discovered by an American astronomer named Days of Hull back in 1877. The scientist had almost given up his pursuit to find Mars moons, but thankfully he was urged to continue the project. The next night he stumbled upon Deimos. Six days after that initial finding, Hull found Phobos. These two space objects may be in fact some asteroids captured by Mars gravity. Another theory suggests they formed in orbit around Mars at about the same time the planet came to be. The fact that Mars has a really weak gravity may also be the reason for this fascinating event. Mars was hit by large asteroids many years ago, just like our planet was. A lot of that debris surely went back to the surface, but some of it was ejected back into space, as Mars' gravity wasn't strong enough to pull them back. They had quite a journey, some of them even ended up on Earth. These pieces of Mars also helped us understand the planet's unique features. We've continued to send robots to the Red Planet quite successfully in the past few decades. But it still remains quite difficult to imagine people will soon land on Mars. Even considering the current rocket technology, the journey would take us six months. And that's an optimistic scenario, given everything goes well on board. After landing, humans will be exposed to deep space radiation and microgravity. Both of these have serious effects on the human body, which we've yet to figure out how to counteract. That's why research is continuously performed on the International Space Station regarding the long-term effects of microgravity. ...of fire and smoke fly upward and the rocket launches. The Delta IV Heavy is one of the most powerful rockets people have ever made. Three massive engines burn tons of fuel, helping the spacecraft gain altitude. The two side boosters undock, leaving the common booster core for further ascent. When in orbit, the rocket releases its payload. This is the Parker Solar Probe, the first spacecraft to touch the sun. And we'll follow its journey step by step. The probe was launched on August 12, 2018, and began its journey toward our star. The sun is 93 million miles away from Earth. That's 390 times the Earth-Moon distance and 36,000 times the width of the United States from coast to coast. The particles of light that the sun emits need eight minutes to travel this distance. For our conventional rockets, that journey would take more than 200 days. But the Parker Solar Probe covered it faster using gravitational maneuvers. On its way from the Earth to the Sun, the probe circled around our neighbor, Venus. All it had to do was enter the planet's gravitational field and let it attract itself. At this point, our space probe got an extra boost, and it didn't need to waste any fuel. After making one orbit, the space probe's engines changed the trajectory, and the probe left the orbit of Venus. It got enough acceleration to travel to the Sun. And on November 5, 2018, the Parker Solar Probe made its first approach to the Sun. Before touching its surface, the spacecraft had to enter the star's orbit first. To achieve this, it did even more gravitational maneuvers. Only after that did it start circling the Sun, the heaviest object in the solar system with the most powerful gravity. So, it'll give the probe an incredible amount of acceleration with each flyby. The Parker Solar Probe was constantly moving between two points. Those were the perihelion and aphelion. Look, 
Here's the Sun, and here's the probe's orbit in the shape of an ellipse. The closest point to the Sun is the perihelion. The Sun was pulling the probe there at an incredible speed. At this point, the probe began to move away from the star. It still had a lot of speed and energy, but it was struggling against the gravitational force of the star. So it gradually slowed down. The point where the probe lost all its acceleration is called aphelion. The star's gravitational force won, and the probe began to move back toward the Sun, picking up speed again. The probe made several circles following a stable orbit, but then its orbit intersected with that of Venus again. Another gravitational maneuver, and after that, the Parker Solar Probe's trajectory shifted slightly, and it gained more speed. The perihelion point of its orbit was now closer to the Sun. The probe made several more circles following this new orbit. Then again, it neared Venus. Another approach to the Sun. Each encounter with Venus corrected the probe's trajectory and gradually reduced its distance from our star. In April 2021, the Parker Solar Probe finally came so close to the Sun that it touched its corona. Although the actual distance between the probe and the Sun was 5.3 million miles, that still counted as a touch. Let's look at the structure of our star by cutting it in half. This is the core of the Sun. It's about a quarter of its width. The core is 150 times as dense as water. Because of the intense pressure and high temperature, nuclear reactions occur there. Hydrogen gets converted into helium, giving off an incredible amount of heat and radiation. The next layer is the radiation zone. This is where the heat is transferred from the core to the next layers. But the photons here don't move in an outward direction. They can be directed anywhere and re-radiated many times. Scientists believe that the average time it takes a photon of light to travel from the core to the next layer of the sun is about 10,000 to 170,000 years. Then there's the convection zone. This is what's considered to be the surface of the sun. But it's not a solid surface. It's an ocean of hot plasma. It looks like a bee honeycomb. That's because the heated plasma rises from the lower layers, creating something like mini geysers. And while it's still hot in the middle of those geysers, their edges cool down, creating an amazing pattern on the sun's surface. The next layers are the sun's atmosphere. First, the photosphere. This is the layer that gives off light. And that's exactly what you see when you look at the sun. But careful, don't do that. You need special equipment to look at our star. The photosphere is up to 250 miles thick. This is about the height at which the International Space Station moves above Earth. Then, the chromosphere, or the sphere of color. This layer of the sun's atmosphere gives the star its reddish hue. Solar prominences appear here. Those are powerful emissions of matter leaving the surface of the sun. Their speed can reach 430 miles per second. At some point, they get caught by the star's magnetic field and pulled back. And then there's the corona, a gaseous envelope of the sun. The most powerful ejections take place there. You can see the corona during eclipses, when the moon covers the solar disk. Then you can notice some kind of glow around the star. This is the corona. It extends for millions of miles around the sun. And the Parker Solar Probe touched precisely that area. That's where solar material and radiation are still tied to the star's gravity and don't fly off into space. And all that is beyond that area is the solar wind. It's the material and radiation that managed to escape the sun's gravity and set off into space. The Parker Solar Probe surprised astronomers by providing more information about this boundary. It turns out it's not a perfect circular wall like we used to think. The boundary is broken and uneven. It looks more like a mountain range. These bumpy regions have such a shape because of the uneven flow of plasma from the surface of the sun. The larger and more powerful the flow, the farther the boundary is from the star's surface. But scientists don't know yet what exactly causes this difference. After making the flyby around the sun, the Parker Solar Probe continued its journey and started to move away from the star again. Researchers are expecting another four approaches in 2022. In August 2023, the probe will make a flyby around Venus. It'll gain more speed and approach the sun at a record close distance. The next Venus flyby will happen in 2024. And hopefully, the Parker Solar Probe will be able to withstand the high temperatures and radiation so close to the sun. Luckily, scientists have taken care of that. The probe has a solar shield. It's attached to the side of the probe that will face the star. 
It's about the size of a house window and about four and a half inches thick. It's made of a special material that can withstand a temperature of about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost six times higher than the temperature of a regular kitchen oven. The body of the probe is made of a white material that reflects sunlight. All the scientific equipment is placed right in the center of the shadow of this shield. If the sun's rays hit the unprotected body of the probe at close range, all the equipment will be out of action in just a few tenths of a second. The Parker Solar Probe is equipped with the Electromagnetic Fields Investigation Instrument. This is a system for measuring electric and magnetic fields, radio waves, temperature, and plasma density. The Wide Field Imager for the Parker Solar Probe, or WISPER, is an optical telescope, the one that took those stunning images of the moving plasma in the sun's corona. These streamers are what you see during solar eclipses. The Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas, and Protons investigation measures protons, electrons, and helium ions. It helps scientists study solar winds. It often harms our technology. Unexpected flares on the surface of the sun can cause severe solar winds. They can burn chips and satellites orbiting Earth. Given that we have the ISS, where people work all the time, we need to know more about solar winds and how to protect ourselves from them. While the Parker Solar Probe continues its research, it's already set several world records. It's the closest to the sun human-made object. It's also the speed record holder. During its final approach to the sun, the probe reached a speed of 101 miles per second. That means it could cover the distance from New York to Los Angeles in just 24 seconds. And a trip around Earth would take about four minutes. A journey to the moon in such a spacecraft would only take 40 minutes. In 2025, the Parker Solar Probe will make its closest approach to the sun reaching a speed of about 430,000 miles per hour. But even this speed is only 0.064% of the speed of light.